Section 25 of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gerald Hoskins. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte. Translated by John Henry Bridges. Section 25. Chapter 5. The Relation of Positivism to Art. Part 4. The aesthetic tendencies of positivism with regard to institutions of this kind are sufficiently evident in the worship of woman, spoken of in the preceding chapter, and in the worship of humanity, of which I shall speak more particularly afterwards. From these, indeed, most positivist festivals, private or public, will originate. But this subject has been already broached, and will be discussed in the next chapter with as much detail as the limits of this introductory work allow. While the social value of art is thus enhanced by the importance of the work assigned to it, new and extensive fields for its operations are opened out by positivism. Chief amongst these is history, regarded as a continuous whole, a domain at present almost untouched. Modern poets, finding little to inspire them in their own times, and driven back into ancient life by the classical old system, have already idealized some of the past phases of humanity. Our great Corneille, for instance, is principally remembered for the series of dramas in which he has so admirably depicted various periods of Roman history. In our own times, where the historical spirit has become stronger, novelists like Scott and Menzoni have made similar, though less perfect, attempts to idealize later periods. Such examples, however, are but spontaneous and imperfect indications of the new field which positivism now offers to the artist, a field which extends over the whole region of the past and even of the future. Until this vast domain had been conceived of as a whole by the philosopher, it would have been impossible to bring it within the compass of poetry. Now theological and metaphysical philosophers were prevented by the absolute spirit of their doctrines from understanding history in all its phases, and were totally incapable of idealizing them as they deserved. Positivism, on the contrary, is always relative, and its principal feature is a theory of history which enables us to appreciate and become familiar with every mode in which human society has formed itself. No sincere monotheist can understand and represent with fairness the life of polytheists or fetichists. But the positivist poet, accustomed to look upon all past historical stages in their proper filiation, will be able so thoroughly to identify himself with all as to awaken our sympathies for them and revive the traces which each individual may recognize of corresponding phases in his own history. Thus we shall be able thoroughly to enter into the aesthetic beauty of the pagan creeds of Greece and Rome without any of the scruples which Christians could not but feel when engaged on the same subject. In the art of the future all phases of the past will be recalled to life with the same distinctness with which some of them have already been idealized by Homer and Corneille. And the value of this new source of inspiration is the greater that, at the same time that is being opened out to the artist, the public is being prepared for its enjoyment. An almost exhaustless series of beautiful creations in epic or dramatic art may be produced, which, by rendering it more easy to comprehend and to glorify the past in all its phases, will form an essential element, on the one hand, of our educational system, and on the other, of the worship of humanity. Lastly, not only will the field for art become wider, but its organs will be men of a higher stamp. The present system in which the arts are cultivated by special classes must be abolished, as being wholly alien to that synthetic spirit which always characterizes the highest poetic genius. Real talent for art cannot fail to be called out by the educational system of positivism, which, though intended for the working classes, is equally applicable to all others. We can only idealize and portray what has become familiar to us. Consequently, poetry has always rested upon some system of belief, capable of giving a fixed direction to our thoughts and feelings. The greatest poets from Homer to Corneille have always participated largely in the best education of which their times admitted. The artist must have clear conceptions before he can exhibit true pictures. Even in these anarchic times, when the system of specialties is being carried to such an irrational extent, the so-called poets who imagine that they can themselves save the trouble of philosophical training 
have in reality to borrow a basis of belief from some worn-out metaphysical or theological creed. Their special education, if it can be called so, consists merely in cultivating the talent for expression, and is equally injurious to their intellect and their heart. Incompatible with deep conviction of any kind, while giving mechanical skill in the technical department of art, it impairs the far more important faculty of idealization. Hence it is that we are at present so deplorably overstocked with verse-makers and literary men, who are wholly devoid of real poetic feeling, and are fit for nothing but to disturb society by their reckless ambition. As for the four special arts, the training for them at present given, being still more technical, is even more hurtful in every respect to the student whose education does not extend beyond it. On every ground, then, artists of whatever kind should begin their career with the same education as the rest of society. The necessity for such an education in the case of women has already been recognized, and it is certainly not less desirable for artists and poets. Indeed, so aesthetic is the spirit of positive education that no special training for art will be needed except that which is given spontaneously by practice. There is no other profession which requires so little direct instruction. The tendency of it in art being to destroy originality and to stifle the fire of genius with technical erudition. Even for the special arts, no professional education is needed. These, like industrial arts, should be acquired by careful practice under the guidance of good masters. The notorious failure of public institutions established for the purpose of forming musicians and painters makes it unnecessary to dwell further upon this point. Not to speak of their injurious effects upon character, they are a positive impediment to true genius. Poets and artists, then, require no education beyond that which is given to the public, whose thoughts and emotions it is their office to represent. Its want of speciality makes it all the more fit to develop and bring forward real talent. It will strengthen the love of all the fine arts simultaneously, for the connection between them is so intimate that those who make it a boast that their talent is for one of them exclusively will be strongly suspected of having no real vocation for any. All the greatest masters, modern no less than ancient, have shown this universality of taste. Its absence in the present day is but a fresh proof that aesthetic genius does not and cannot exist in times like these, when art has no social purpose and rests on no philosophic principles. If even amateurs are expected to enjoy art in all its forms, is it likely that composers of real genius will restrict their admiration to their own special mode of idealization and expression? Positivism, then, while infusing a profoundly aesthetic spirit into general education, would suppress all special schools of art on the ground that they impede its true growth, and simply promote the success of mediocrities. When this principle is carried out to its full length, we shall no longer have any special class of artists. The culture of art, especially of poetry, will be a spontaneous addition to the functions of the three classes which constitute the moral power of society. Under theocracy, the system by which the evolution of human society was inaugurated, the speculative class absorbed all functions except those relating to the common business of life. No distinction was made between aesthetic and scientific talent. Their separation took place afterwards, and though it was indispensable to the full development of both, yet it forms no part of the permanent order of society in which the only well-marked division is that between theory and practice. Ultimately, all theoretic faculties will be again combined even more closely than in primitive times. So long as they are dispersed, their full influence on practical life cannot be realized. Only it was necessary that they should remain dispersed until each constituent element had attained a sufficient degree of development. For this preliminary growth, the long period of time that has elapsed since the decline of theocracy was necessary. Art detached itself from the theoretical system before science because its progress was more rapid and from its nature it was more independent. The priesthood have lost its hold of art as far back as the time of Homer but it still continued to be the depositary of science, until it was superseded at first by philosophers, strictly so called, afterwards by mathematicians and astronomers. So it was that art first, and subsequently science, 
yielded to the specializing system which, though normal for industry, is in their case abnormal. It stimulated the growth of our speculative faculties at the time of their escape from the yoke of theocracy. But now that the need for it no longer exists, it is the principal obstacle to the final order, towards which all their partial developments have been tending. To recombine these special elements on new principles is at present the primary condition of social regeneration. Looking at the two essential functions of the spiritual power, education and counsel, it is not difficult to see that what they require is a combination of poetic feeling with scientific insight. We look for a measure of both these qualities in the public. Therefore, men who are devoid of either of them cannot be fit to be its spiritual guides. That they take the name of philosophers in preference to that of poets is because their ordinary duties are more connected with science than with art, but they ought to be equally interested in both. Science requires systematic teaching, whereas art is cultivated spontaneously, with the exception of the technical branches of the special arts. It must be remembered that the highest aesthetic functions are not such as can be performed continuously. It is only works of rare excellence which are in the highest sense useful. These, once produced, supply an unfailing source of idealization and expression for our emotions, whether in public or in private. It is enough if the interpreter of these works and his audience have been so educated as to appreciate what is perfect and reject mediocrity. Organs of unusual power will arise occasionally, as in former times, from all sections of society, whenever the need of representing new emotions may be felt. But they will come more frequently from the philosophic class in whose characters, when it is fully developed, sympathy will be as prominent a feature as system. There is, in truth, no organic distinction between scientific and poetic genius. The difference lies merely in their combinations of thought, which are concrete and ideal in the one case, abstract and real in the other. Both employ analysis at starting. Both alike aim ultimately at synthesis. The erroneous belief in their incompatibility proceeds merely from the absolute spirit of metaphysical philosophy, which so often leads us to mistake a transitory phase for the permanent order. If it is the fact, as appears, that they have never been actually combined in the same person, it is merely because the two functions cannot be called into action at the same moment. A state of society that calls for great philosophical efforts cannot be favorable to poetry because it involves a new elaboration of first principles, and it is essential to art that these should have already been fixed. This is the reason why in history we find periods of aesthetic growth succeeding periods of great philosophical change, but never coexisting. If we look at instances of great minds who were never able to find their proper sphere, we see at once that they had risen at some other time, that they might have cultivated either poetry or philosophy, as the case might be, with equal success. Diderot would no doubt have been a great poet in a time more favorable to art, and Goethe, under different political influences, might have been an eminent philosopher. All scientific discoverers, in whom the inductive faculty has been more active than the deductive, have given manifest proof of poetic capacity. Whether the powers of invention take an abstract or concrete direction, whether they are employed in discovering truth or in idealizing it, the cerebral function is always essentially the same. The difference is merely in the objects aimed at and as these alternate according to the circumstances of the time, they cannot both be pursued simultaneously. The remarkably synthetic character of Buffon's genius may be looked on historically as an instance of fusion of the scientific and aesthetic spirit. Boussois is even a more striking instance of a mind equally capable of the deepest philosophy and of the sublimest poetry, had the circumstances of his life given him a more definite impulse in either direction. It is then not unreasonable to expect, notwithstanding the opinion usually maintained, that the philosophical class will furnish poets of the highest rank when the time calls for them. To pass from scientific thought to aesthetic thought will not be difficult for minds of the highest order, for in such minds there is always a natural inclination towards the work which is most urgently required by their age. To meet the technical conditions of the arts of sound and form, it will be necessary to provide a few special masters who, 
in consideration of the importance of their services to general education, will be looked upon as accessory members of the new spiritual power. But even here, the tendency to specialties will be materially restricted. This exceptional position will only be given to men of sufficient aesthetic power to appreciate all the fine arts, and they should be capable of practicing at least the three arts of form simultaneously, as was done by Italian painters in the 16th century. As an ordinary rule, it is only by their appreciation and power of explaining ideal art in all its forms that our philosophers will exhibit their aesthetic faculty. They will not be actively engaged in aesthetic functions, except in the arrangement of public festivals. But when the circumstances of the time are such as to call for great epic or dramatic works, which implies the absence of any philosophical question of the first importance, the most powerful minds among them will become poets in the common sense of the word. As the work of coordination and that of idealization will for the future alternate with greater rapidity, we might conceive them, were man's life longer, performed by the same organ. But the shortness of life and the necessity of youthful vigor for all great undertakings excludes this hypothesis. I only mention it to illustrate the radical identity of two forms of mental activity which are often supposed incompatible. An additional proof of the aesthetic capacity of the moderating power in works of less difficulty, but admitting of greater frequency, will be furnished by its feminine element. In the special arts, or at least in the arts of form, but little can be expected of them, because these demand more technical knowledge than they can well acquire and, moreover, the slow process of training would spoil the spontaneousness which is so admirable in them. But for all poetic composition which does not require intense or prolonged effort, women of genius are better qualified than men. This they should consider as their proper department intellectually, since their nature is not well adapted for the discovery of scientific truth. When women have become more systematically associated with the general movement of society under the influence of the new system of education, they will do much to elevate that class of poetry which relates to personal feelings and to domestic life. Women are already better judges of such poetry than men, and there is no reason why they should not excel them in composing it. For the power of appreciating and that of producing are in reality identical. The difference is in degree only, and it depends greatly upon culture. The only kind of composition which seems to me to be beyond their power is epic or dramatic poetry in which public life is depicted. But in all its other branches, poetry would seem their natural field of study, and one which, regarded always as an exceptional occupation, is quite in keeping with the social duties assigned to them. The affections of our home life cannot be better portrayed than by those in whom they are found in their purest form, and who, without training, combine talent and expression, with the tendency to idealize. Under a more perfect organization, then, of the aesthetic world than prevails at present, the larger portion of poetical and perhaps also of musical productions will pass into the hands of the more loving sex. The advantage of this will be that the poetry of private life will then rise to that high standard of moral purity of which it is so peculiarly admits, but which our coarser sex can never attain without struggles which injure its spontaneity. The simple grace of La Fontaine and the delicate sweetness of Petrarch will then be found united with deeper and purer sympathies, so as to raise lyrical poetry to a degree of perfection that has never yet been attained. The popular element of the spiritual power has not so well marked an aptitude for art, since the active nature of their occupations hardly admits of the same degree of intellectual life. But there is a minor class of poems, where energy of character and freedom from worldly cares are the chief sources of inspiration, for which working men are better adapted than women, and far more so than philosophers. When positivist education has extended sufficiently to the people of the West, Poets and musicians will spontaneously arise, as in many cases they have already risen, to give expression to its own special aspirations. But independently of what may be due to individual efforts, the people as a whole has an indirect but most important influence upon the progress of art from the fact of being the principal source of language. Such, then, is the position which art will finally assume in the positive system. There will be no class at present exclusively devoted to it, with the exception of a few special masters. 
but there will be a general education enabling every class to appreciate all the modes of idealization and encouraging their culture among the three elements which constitute the moral force of society and which are excluded from political government. Among these there will be a division of aesthetic labor. Poetry descriptive of public life will emanate from the philosophic class. The poetry of personal or domestic life will be written by women or working men, according as affection or energy may be the source of inspiration. Thus, the form of mental activity most appropriate to humanity will be more specially developed among those classes in which the various features of our nature are most prominently exhibited. The only classes who cannot participate in this pleasant task are those whose life is occupied by considerations of power or wealth, and whose enjoyment of art, though heightened by the education which they in common with others will receive, must remain essentially passive. Our idealizing powers will henceforth be directly concentrated on a work of the highest social importance, the purification of our moral nature. The specialty by which so much of the natural charm of art was lost will cease, and the moral dangers of a life exclusively devoted to the faculty of expression will exist no longer. I have now shown the position which art will occupy in the social system as finally constituted. I have yet to speak of its influence in the actual movement of regeneration which positivism is inaugurating. We have already seen that each of the three classes who participate in this movement assumes functions similar to those for which it is ultimately destined, performing them in a more strenuous, though less methodic, way. This is obviously true of the philosophic class who head the movement, nor is it less true of the proletariat from which it derives its vigor, or of women whose support gives it a moral sanction. It is, therefore, at first sight probable that the saying will hold good of the aesthetic conditions which are necessary to the completeness of these three functions of the social organism. On closer examination, we shall find that this is the case. The principal function of art is to construct types on the basis furnished by science. Now this is precisely what is required for inaugurating the new social system. However perfectly its first principles may be elaborated by thinkers, they will still not be sufficiently definite for the practical result. Systematic study of the past can only reveal the future in general outline. Even in the simpler sciences, perfect distinctness is impossible without overstepping the limits of actual proof. Still more, therefore, in sociology will the conclusions of science fall always far short of that degree of precision and clearness without which no principle can be thoroughly popularized. But at the point where philosophy must always leave a void, poetry steps in and stimulates to practical action. In the early periods of polytheism, poetry repaired the defects of the system viewed dogmatically. Its value will be even greater in idealizing a system founded not upon imagination, but upon observation of fact. In the next chapter, I shall dwell at greater length on the service which poetry will render in representing the central conception of positivism. It will be easy to apply the same principle to other cases. In his efforts to accomplish this object, the positivist poet will naturally be led to form prophetic pictures of the regeneration of man, viewed in every aspect that admits of being ideally represented. And this is the second service which art will render the cause of social renovation, or rather it is an extension of the first. Systematic formation of utopias will in fact become habitual, on the distinct understanding that, as in every other branch of art, the ideal shall be kept in subordination to the real. The unlimited license which is apparently given to utopias by the unsettled character of the time is in reality a bar to their practical influence since even the wildest dreamers shrink from extravagance that oversteps the ordinary conditions of mental sanity. But when it is once understood that the sphere of imagination is simply that of explaining and giving life to the conclusions of reason, the severest thinkers will welcome its influence, because so far from obscuring truth, it will give greater distinctness to it than could be given by science unassisted. Utopias have, then, their legitimate purpose, and positivism will strongly encourage their formation. They form a class of poetry which, under sound sociological principles, will prove of material service in leading the people of the West towards the normal state. 
each of the five modes of art may participate in this salutary influence each in its own way may give a foretaste of the beauty and greatness of the new life that is now offered to the individual to the family and to society from this second mode in which art assists the great work of reconstruction we pass naturally to a third which at the present time is of equal importance to remove the spell under which the western nations are still blinded to the future by the decayed ruins of the past all that is necessary is to bring these ruins into comparison with the prophetic pictures of which we have been speaking since the decline of catholicism in the fourteenth century art has exhibited a critical spirit alien to its true nature which is essentially synthetic henceforth it is to be constructive rather than critical yet this is not incompatible with the secondary object of contending against opinions and still more against modes of life which ought to have died out with the catholic system or with the revolutionary period which followed it but resistance to some of the most deeply rooted errors of the past will not interfere with the larger purpose of positivist art no direct criticism will be needed whether against theological or against metaphysical dogmas argument is henceforth needless even in a philosophical treatise much more so in poetry all that is needed is simple contrast which in most cases would be implied rather than expressed of the procedure of positivism and catholicism in reference to similar social and moral problems the scientific basis of such a contrast is already furnished it is for art to do the rest since the appeal should be to feeling rather than to reason at the close of this chapter i mentioned the principal case in which this comparison would have been of surface the introduction namely of positivism to the two southern nations it was the task that i had marked out for my saintly fellow worker for it is one in which the aesthetic powers of women would be peculiarly available in this the third of its temporary functions positivist art approximates to its normal character we have spoken of its idealization of the future but here it will idealize the past also positivism cannot be accepted until it has rendered the fullest and most scrupulous justice to catholicism our poets so far from detracting from the moral and political worth of the medieval system will begin by doing all the honor to it that is consistent with philosophical truth as a prelude to the still higher beauty of the system which supersedes it it will be the inauguration of their permanent office of restoring the past to life for it is equally in the interest of systematic thought and of social sympathy that the relation of the past to the future should be deeply impressed upon all but these three steps toward the incorporation of art into the final order though not far distant cannot be taken immediately they presuppose a degree of intellectual preparation which is not yet reached either by the public or by its aesthetic teachers the present generation under which in france the great revolution is now peacefully entering upon its second phase may diffuse positivism largely not merely amongst qualified thinkers but among the people of paris who are entrusted with the destinies of western europe and among women of nobler nature the next generation growing up in the midst of this movement may before the expiration of a century from the date of the convention complete spontaneously the moral and mental inauguration of the new system by exhibiting the new aesthetic features which humanity in her regenerate condition will assume let us now sum up the conclusions of this chapter we have found positive philosophy peculiarly favorable to the continuous development of all the fine arts a doctrine which encourages humanity to strive for perfection of every kind cannot but foster and assimilate that form of mental activity by which our sense of perfection is so highly stimulated it controls the ideal indeed by systematic study of the real but only in order to furnish it with an objective basis and so to secure its coherence and its moral value placed on this footing our aesthetic faculties are better adapted than the scientific both to the nature and range of our understanding and also to that which is the object of all intellectual effort the organization of human unity for they are more immediately connected with feeling on which the unity of our nature must rest next to direct culture of the heart it is an ideal art that we shall find the best assistance in our efforts to become more loving and more noble logically art should have a salutary influence upon our intellectual faculties because it familiarizes us from childhood 
with the features by which all constructive efforts of man should be characterized. Science has for a long time preferred the analytic method, whereas art, even in these times of anarchy, always aims at synthesis, which is the final goal of all intellectual activity. Even when art, contrary to its nature, undertakes to destroy, it cannot do its work, whatever it be, without constructing. Thus, by implanting a taste and faculty for ideal construction, art enables us to build with greater effect than ever upon the more stubborn soil of reality. On all these grounds, art in the positive system is made the primary basis of general education. In a subsequent stage, education assumes a more scientific character with the object of supplying systematic notions of the external world. But in afterlife, art resumes its original position. There, the ordinary functions of the spiritual power will be aesthetic rather than scientific. The three elements of which the modifying power is composed will become spontaneously the organs of idealization, a function which will henceforth never be dissociated from the power of philosophic synthesis. Such a combination implies that the new philosophers shall have a true feeling for all the fine arts. In ordinary times, passive appreciation of them will suffice. But there will occasionally be periods where philosophic effort ceases to be necessary, and which call rather for the vigor of the poet. And at these times, the more powerful minds among them should be capable of rising to the loftiest creative efforts. Difficult as the condition may be, it is essential to the full degree of moral influence of which their office admits and which their work requires. The priest of humanity will not have attained his full measure of superiority over the priest of God until, with the intellect of the philosopher, he combines the enthusiasm of the poet as well as the tenderness of woman and the people's energy. End of section 25section 26 of a general view of positivism this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a general view of positivism by august comte translated by john henry bridges section 26 chapter 6 conclusion the religion of humanity part 1 love then is our principle order our basis and progress our end such as the preceding chapters have shown is the essential character of the system of life which positivism offers for the definite acceptance of society a system which regulates the whole course of our private and public existence by bringing feeling reason and activity into perfect harmony in this final synthesis all essential conditions are far more perfectly fulfilled than in any other each special element of our nature is more fully developed and at the same time the general working of the whole is more coherent greater distinctness is given to the truth that the affective element predominates in our natures life in all its actions and thoughts is brought under the control and inspiring charm of social sympathy by the supremacy of the heart the intellect so far from being crushed is elevated for all its powers are consecrated to the service of the social instincts with the purpose of strengthening their influence and directing their employment by accepting its subordination to feeling reason adds to its own authority to it we look for the revelation of the laws of nature of the established order which dictates the inevitable conditions of human life the objective basis thus discovered for human effort reacts most beneficially on our moral nature forced as we are to accept it it controls the fickleness to which our affections are liable and acts as a direct stimulus to social sympathy concentrated on so high an office the intellect will be preserved from useless digression and will yet find a boundless field for its operations in the study of all the natural laws by which human destinies are affected 
and especially those which relate to the constitution of man or of society the fact that every subject is to be regarded from the sociological point of view so far from discouraging even the most abstract order of speculations adds to their local coherence as well as to their moral value by introducing the central principle round which alone they can be coordinated into a whole and whilst reason is admitted to its due share of influence on human life imagination is also strengthened and called into constant exercise henceforth it will assume its proper function the idealization of truth from the objective basis of our conceptions scientific investigation is necessary but this basis once obtained the constitution of our mind is far better adapted to ascetic than to scientific study provided always that imagination never disregard the truths of science and degenerate into extravagance subject to this condition positivism gives every encouragement to ascetic studies being as they are so closely related to its guiding principle and to its practical aim to love namely and to progress art will enter largely into the social life of the future and will be regarded as the most pleasurable and most salutary exercise of our intellectual powers because it leads them in the most direct manner to the culture and improvement of our moral nature originating in the first instance from practical life positivism will return hither with increased force now that its long period of scientific preparation is accomplished and that it has occupied the field of moral truth which henceforth will be its principal domain its principle of sympathy so far from relaxing our efforts will stimulate all our faculties to universal activity by urging them onwards towards perfection of every kind scientific study of the natural order is inculcated solely with the view of directing all the forces of man and of society to its improvement by artificial effort hitherto this aim has hardly been recognized even with regard to the material world and but a very small proportion of our energies has been spent upon it yet the aim is high provided always that the view taken of human progress extend beyond its lower and more material stages our theoretical powers once concentrated on the moral problems which form their principal field our practical energies will not fail to take the same direction devoting themselves to that portion of the natural order which is most imperfect and at the same time most modifiable with these larger and more systematic views of human life its best efforts will be given to the improvement of the mind and still more to the improvement of the character and to the increase of affection and courage public and private life are now brought into close relation by the identity of their principal aim which being kept constantly in sight ennobles every action in both practical questions must ever continue to preponderate as before over questions of theory but this condition so far from being adverse to speculative power concentrates upon it the most difficult of all problems the discovery of moral and social laws our knowledge of which will never be fully adequate to our practical requirements mental and practical activity of this kind can never result in hardness of feeling on the contrary it impresses us more strongly with the conviction that sympathy is not merely our highest happiness but the most effectual of all our means of improvement and that without it all other means can be of little avail thus it is that in the positive system the heart the intellect and the character mutually strengthen and develop one another because each is systematically directed to the mode of action for which it is by nature adapted 
public and private life are brought into a far more harmonious relation than in any former time because the purpose to which both are consecrated is identical the difference being merely in the range of their activities the aim in both is to secure to the utmost possible extent the victory of social feeling over self-love and to this aim all our powers whether of affection thought or action are in both unceasingly directed this then is the shape in which the great human problem becomes definitely before us its solution demands all the appliances of social art the primary principle on which the solution rests is the separation of the two elementary powers of society the moral power of counsel and the political powers of command the necessary preponderance of the latter which rests upon material force corresponds to the fact that in our imperfect nature where the coarser wants are the more pressing and the most continuously felt the selfish instincts are naturally stronger than the unselfish in the absence of all compulsory authority our action even as individuals would be feeble and purposeless and social life still more certainly would lose its character and its energy moral force therefore by which is meant the force of conviction and persuasion is to be regarded simply as a modifying influence not as a means of authoritative direction moral force originates in feeling and in reason it represents the social side of our nature and to this its direct influence is limited indeed by the very fact that it is the expression of our highest attributes it is precluded from that practical ascendancy which is possessed by faculties of a lower but more energetic kind inferior to material force in power though superior to it in dignity it contrasts and opposes its own classification of men according to the standard of moral and intellectual worth to the classification by wealth and worldly position which actually prevails true the higher standard will never be adopted practically but the effort to uphold it will react beneficially on the natural order of society it will inspire those larger views and reanimate that sense of duty which are so apt to become obliterated in the ordinary current of life the means of effecting this important result the need of which is so generally felt will not be wanting when the moderating power enters upon its characteristic function of preparing us for practical life by a rational system of education throughout which even in its intellectual development moral considerations will predominate this power will therefore concentrate itself upon theoretical and moral questions and it can only maintain its position as the recognized organ of social sympathy by invariable abstinence from political action it will be its first duty to contend against the ambitious instincts of its own members true such instincts in spite of the impurity of their source may be of use in those natures who are really destined for the indispensable business of government but for a spiritual power formal renunciation of wealth and rank is at the very root of its influence it is the first of the conditions which justify it in resisting the encroachments to which political power is always tempted hence the classes to whose natural sympathies it looks for support are those who like itself are excluded from political administration women from their strong sympathetic nature are the original source of all moral influence and they are particularly qualified by the passive character of their life to assist the action of the spiritual power in the family in its essential function of education their cooperation is of the highest importance the education of young children is entrusted to their sole charge and the education of more advanced years simply consists in giving a more systematic shape 
to what the mother has already inculcated in childhood as a wife too woman assumes still more distinctly the spiritual function of counsel she softens by persuasion where the philosopher can only influence by conviction in social meetings again the only mode of public life in which women can participate they assist the spiritual function in the formation of public opinion of which it is the systematic organ by applying the principles which it inculcates to the case of particular actions or persons in all these matters their influence will be far more effectual than men when men have done their duty to women by setting them free from the necessity of gaining their own livelihood and when women on their side have renounced both power and wealth as we see so often exemplified among the working classes the affinity of the people with the philosophic power is less direct and less pure but it will prove a vigorous ally in meeting the obstacles which the temporal power will inevitably oppose the working classes having but little spare time and small individual influence cannot except on rare occasions participate in the practical administration of government since all efficient government involves concentration of power moral force on the contrary created as it is by free convergence of opinion admits of and indeed requires the widest ramification working men owing to their freedom from practical responsibilities and their unconcern for personal aggrandizement are better disposed than their employers to broad views and to generous sympathies and will therefore naturally associate themselves with the spiritual power it is they who will furnish the basis of a true public opinion so soon as they are enabled by positive education which is specially framed with a view to their case to give greater definiteness to their aspirations their wants and their sympathies will alike induce them to support the philosophic priesthood as the systematic guardian of their interests against the governing classes in return for such protection they will bring the whole weight of their influence to assist the priesthood in its great social mission the subordination of politics to morals in those exceptional cases where it becomes necessary for the moderating power to assume political functions the popular element will of itself suffice for the emergency thus exempting the philosophic element from participating in an anomaly from which its character could hardly fail to suffer as would be the case also in a still higher degree with the feminine character the direct influence of reason over our imperfect nature is so feeble that the new priesthood could not of itself ensure such respect for its theories as would bring them to any practical result but the sympathies of women and of the people operating as they will in every town and in every family will be sufficient to ensure its efficiency in organizing that legitimate degree of moral pressure which the poor may bring to bear upon the rich moreover we may look as one of the results of our common system of education for additional aid in the ranks of the governing classes themselves for some of their noblest members will volunteer their assistance to the spiritual power forming so to speak a new order of chivalry and yet with all this comprehensive as our organization of moral force may be so great is the innate strength of the selfish instincts that our success in solving the great human problem will always fall short of what we might legitimately desire to this conclusion we must come in whatever way we regard the destiny of man but it should only encourage us to combine our efforts still more strongly in order to ameliorate the order of nature in its most important that is in its moral aspects these being at once the most modifiable and the most imperfect
the highest progress of man and of society consists in gradual increase of our mastery over all our defects especially the defects of our moral nature among the nations of antiquity the progress in this direction was but small all that they could do was to prepare the way for it by certain necessary phases of intellectual and social development the whole tendency of greek and roman society was such as made it impossible to form a distinct conception of the great problem of our moral nature in fact morals were with them invariably subordinate to politics nevertheless it is moral progress which alone can satisfy our nature and in the middle ages it was recognized as the highest aim of human effort notwithstanding that its intellectual and social conditions were as yet very imperfectly realized the creeds of the middle ages were too unreal and imperfect the character of society was too military and aristocratic to allow morals and politics to assume permanently their right relation the attempt was made however and inadequate as it was it was enough to allow the people of the west to appreciate the fundamental principle involved in it a principle destined to survive the opinions of the habits of life from which it arose its full weight could never be felt until the positive spirit had extended beyond the elementary subjects to which it had been so long subjected to the sphere of social truth and had thus reached the position at which a complete synthesis became possible equally essential was it that in those countries which had been incorporated into the western empire and had passed from it into catholic feudalism war should be definitely superseded by industrial activity in the long period of transition which has elapsed since the middle ages both these conditions have been fulfilled while at the same time the old system has been gradually decomposed finally the great crisis of the revolution has stimulated all advanced minds to reconsider with better intellectual and social principles the same problem that christianity and chivalry had attempted the radical solution of it was then begun and it is now completed and enunciated in a systematic form by positivism all essential phases in the evolution of society answer to corresponding phases in the growth of the individual whether it has proceeded spontaneously or under systematic guidance supposing always that this development be complete but it is not enough to prove the close connection which exists between all modes and degrees of human regeneration we have yet to find a central point round which all will naturally meet in this point consists the unity of positivism as a system of life unless it can be thus condensed round one single principle it will never wholly supersede the synthesis of theology notwithstanding its superiority in the reality and stability of its component parts and in their homogeneity and coherence as a whole there should be a central point in the system towards which feeling reason and activity alike converge the proof that positivism possesses such a central point will remove the last obstacles to its complete acceptance as the guide of private or of public life such a centre we find in the great conception of humanity towards which every aspect of positivism naturally converges by it the conception of god will be entirely superseded and a synthesis be formed more complete and permanent than that provisionally established by the old religions through it the new doctrine becomes at once accessible to men's hearts in its full extent and application from their heart it will penetrate their minds and thus the immediate necessity of beginning with a long and difficult course of study is avoided though this must of course be always indispensable to its systematic teachers 
this central point of positivism is even more moral than intellectual in character it represents the principle of love upon which the whole system rests it is the peculiar character of the supreme being who is here set forth to be compounded with separable elements its existence depends therefore entirely upon mutual love knitting together its various parts the calculations of self-interest can never be substituted as a combining influence for the sympathetic instincts yet the belief in humanity while stimulating sympathy at the same time enlarges the scope and vigor of the intellect for it requires high powers of generalization to conceive clearly of this vast organism as the result of spontaneous cooperation abstraction made of all possible antagonisms reason then has its part in this central dogma as well as love it enlarges and completes our conception of the supreme being by revealing to us the external and internal conditions of its existence lastly our active powers are stimulated by it no less than our feelings and our reason for since humanity is so far more complex than any other organism it will react more strongly and more continuously on its environment submitting to the influence and so modifying it hence results progress which is simply the development of order under the influence of love thus in the conception of humanity the three essential aspects of positivism its subjective principle its objective dogma and its practical object are united towards humanity who is for us the only true great being we the conscious elements of whom she is composed shall henceforth direct every aspect of our life individual or collective our thoughts will be devoted to the knowledge of humanity our affections to her love our actions to her service positivists then may more truly than theological believers of whatever creed regard life as a continuous and earnest act of worship worship which will elevate and purify our feelings enlarge and enlighten our thoughts ennoble and invigorate our actions it supplies a direct solution so far as a solution is possible of the great problem of the middle ages the subordination of politics to morals for this follows at once from the consecration now given to the principle that social sympathy should preponderate over self-love thus positivism becomes in the true sense of the word a religion the only religion which is real and complete destined therefore to replace all imperfect and provisional systems resting on the primitive basis of theology end of section twenty six section twenty seven of a general view of positivism this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Grace, Rochester, New York. A General View of Positivism by August Comte. Translated by John Henry Bridges. Section 27, Chapter 6. Conclusion. The Religion of Humanity. Part 2. For even the synthesis established by the old theocracies of egypt and india was insufficient because being based on purely subjective principles it could never embrace practical life which must always be subordinated to the objective realities of the external world theocracy was thus limited at the outset to the sphere of thought and of feeling and part 
even of this field was soon lost when art became emancipated from theocratical control showing a spontaneous tendency to its natural vocation of idealizing real life of science and of morality the priests were still left sole arbiters but here too their influence materially diminished so soon as the discovery of the simpler abstract truths of positive science gave birth to greek philosophy philosophy though as yet necessarily restricted to the metaphysical stage yet already stood forward as the rival of the sacerdotal system its attempts to construct were in themselves fruitless but they overthrew polytheism and ultimately transformed it into monotheism in this the last phase of theology the intellectual authority of the priests was undermined no less deeply than the principle of their doctrine they lost their hold upon science as long ago they had lost their hold upon art all that remained to them was the moral guidance of society and even this was soon compromised by the progress of free thought progress really due to the positive spirit although its systematic exponents still belong to the metaphysical school when science had expanded sufficiently to exist apart from philosophy it showed a rapid tendency towards a synthesis of its own alike incompatible with metaphysics and with theology it was late in appearing because it required a long series of preliminary efforts but as it approached completion it gradually brought the positive spirit to bear upon the organization of practical life from which that spirit had originally emanated but thoroughly to effect this result was impossible until the science of sociology had been formed and this was done by my discovery of the law of historical development henceforth all true men of science will rise to the higher dignity of philosophers and by so doing will necessarily assume something of the sacerdotal character because the final result to which their researches tend is the subordination of every subject of thought to the moral principle a result which leads us at once to the acceptance of a complete and homogeneous synthesis thus the philosophers of the future become priests of humanity and their moral and intellectual influence will be far wider and more deeply rooted than that of any former priesthood the primary condition of their spiritual authority is exclusion from political power as a guarantee that theory and practice shall be systematically kept apart a system in which the organs of counsel and those of command are never identical cannot possibly degenerate into any of the evils of theocracy by entirely renouncing wealth and worldly position and that not as individuals merely but as a body the priests of humanity will occupy a position of unparalleled dignity for with their moral influence they will combine what since the downfall of the old theocracies has always been separated from it the influence of superiority in art and science reason imagination and feeling will be brought into unison and so united will react strongly on the imperious conditions of practical life bringing it into closer accordance with the laws of universal morality from which it is so prone to deviate and the influence of this new modifying power will be the greater that the synthesis on which it rests will have preceded and prepared the way for the social system of the future whereas theology could not arrive at its central principle until the time of its decline was approaching all functions then that cooperate in the elevation of man will be regenerated by the positive priesthood science poetry morality will be devoted to the study the praise and the love of humanity in order that under their combined influence our political action may be more unremittingly given to her service with such a mission science acquires a position of unparalleled importance as the sole means through which we come to know the nature and conditions of this great being the worship of whom should be the distinctive feature of our whole life for this all-important knowledge the study of sociology would seem to suffice but sociology itself depends on preliminary study first of the outer world in which the actions of humanity take place and secondly of man the individual agent 
The object of positivist worship is not like that of theological believers, an absolute, isolated, incomprehensible being whose existence admits of no demonstration or comparison with anything real. The evidence of the being here set forward is spontaneous and is shrouded in no mystery. Before we can praise, love, and serve humanity as we ought, we must know something of the laws which govern her existence, an existence more complicated than any other of which we are cognizant. And by virtue of this complexity, humanity possesses the attributes of vitality in a higher degree than any other organization. That is to say, there is at once more intimate harmony of the component elements and more complete subordination to the external world. Immense as is the magnitude of this organism, measured both in time and space, yet each of its parts carefully examined will show the general consensus of the whole. At the same time, it is more dependent than any other upon the conditions of the outer world. In other words, upon the sum of the laws that regulate inferior phenomena. Like other vital organisms, it submits to mathematical, astronomical, physical, chemical, and biological conditions, and in addition to these is subject to special laws of sociology, with which lower organisms are not concerned. But as a further result of its higher complexity, it reacts upon the world more powerfully, and is, indeed, in a true sense, its chief Scientifically defined, then, it is truly the supreme being, the being who manifests to the fullest extent all the highest attributes of life. But there is yet another feature peculiar to humanity and one of primary importance. That feature is that the elements of which she is composed must always have an independent existence. In other organisms, the parts have no existence when severed from the whole. But this, the greatest of all organisms, is made up of lives which can really be separated. There is, as we have seen, harmony of parts as well as independence, but the last of these conditions is as indispensable as the first. Humanity would cease to be superior to other beings were it possible for her elements to become inseparable. The two conditions are equally necessary, but the difficulty of reconciling them is so great as to account at once for the slowness with which this highest of all organisms has been developed. It must not, however, be supposed that the new supreme being is, like the old, merely a subjective result of our powers of abstraction. Its existence is revealed to us, on the contrary, by close investigation of objective fact. Man, indeed, as an individual, cannot properly be said to exist, except in the exaggerated abstractions of modern metaphysicians. Existence, in the true sense, can only be predicated of humanity, although the complexity of her nature prevented men from forming a systematic conception of it until the necessary stages of scientific initiation had been passed. Bearing this conclusion in mind, we shall be able now to distinguish in humanity two distinct orders of functions, those by which she acts upon the world and those which bind together her component parts. Humanity cannot herself act otherwise than by her separable members, but the efficiency of these members depends upon their working in cooperation, whether instinctively or with design. We find, then, external functions relating principally to the material existence of this organism, and internal functions by which its movable elements are combined. This distinction is but an application of the great theory, due to Bichat's genius of the distinction between the life of nutrition and the life of relation which we find in the individual organism. Philosophically, it is the source from which we derive the great social principle of separation of spiritual from temporal power. The temporal power governs, it originates in the personal instincts, and it stimulates activity. On it depends social order. The spiritual power can only moderate, it is the exponent of our social instincts, and it promotes cooperation, which is the guarantee of progress. Of these functions of humanity, the first corresponds to the function of nutrition, the second to that of innervation in the individual organism. Having now viewed our subject statically, we may come to its dynamical aspect, reserving more detailed discussion for the third volume of this treatise, 
which deals with my fundamental theory of human development. The great being, whom we worship, is not immutable any more than it is absolute. Its nature is relative, and as such is eminently capable of growth. In a word, it is the most vital of all living beings known to us. It extends and becomes more complex by the continuous succession of generations, but in its progressive changes, as well as in its permanent functions, it is subject to invariable laws. And these laws, considered, as we may now consider them, as a whole, form a more sublime object of contemplation than the solemn inaction of the old supreme being, whose existence was passive except when interrupted by acts of arbitrary and unintelligible volition. Thus it is only by positive science that we can appreciate this highest of all destinies to which all the fatalities of individual life are subordinate. It is with this, as with subjects of minor importance, systematic study of the past is necessary in order to determine the future, and so explain the tendencies of the present. Let us then pass from the conception of humanity as fully developed to the history of its rise and progress, a history in which all other modes of progress are included. In ancient times the conception was incompatible with the theological spirit and also with the military character of society, which involved the slavery of the productive classes. The feeling of patriotism, restricted as it was at first, was the only prelude then possible to the recognition of humanity. From this narrow nationality there arose in the Middle Ages the feeling of universal brotherhood. As soon as military life had entered on its defensive phase, and all supernatural creeds had spontaneously merged into a monotheistic form common to the whole West. The growth of chivalry and the attempt made to effect a permanent separation of the two social powers announced already the subordination of politics to morals, and thus showed that the conception of humanity was in direct course of preparation. But the unreal and antisocial nature of the medieval creed and the military and aristocratic character of feudal society made it impossible to go very far in this direction. The abolition of personal slavery was the most essential result of this important period. Society could now assume its industrial character, and feelings of fraternity were encouraged by modes of life in which all classes alike participated. Meanwhile, the growth of the positive spirit was proceeding and preparing the way for the establishment of social science by which alone all other positive studies should be systematized. This being done, the conception of the great being became possible. It was with reference to subjects of a speculative and scientific nature that the conception first arose in a distinct shape. As early as two centuries ago, Pascal spoke of the human race as one man. Amidst the inevitable decline of the theological and military system, men became conscious of the movement of society which had now advanced through so many phases, and the notion of progress as a distinctive feature of humanity became admitted. Still, the conception of humanity as the basis for a new synthesis was impossible until the crisis of the French Revolution. That crisis, on the one hand, proved the urgent necessity for social regeneration, and on the other gave birth to the only philosophy capable of effecting it, Thus our consciousness of the new great being has advanced coextensively with its growth. Our present conception of it is as much the measure of our social progress as it is the summary of positive knowledge. In speaking of the dignity of science, when regenerated by this lofty application of it, I do not refer solely to the special science of social phenomenon, but also to the preliminary studies of life and of the inorganic world both of which form an essential portion of positive doctrine. A social mission of high importance will be recognized in the most elementary sciences, whether it be for the sake of their method or for the value of their scientific results. True, the religion of humanity will lead to the entire abolition of scientific academies, because their tendency, especially in France, is equally hurtful to science and morality. They encourage mathematicians to confine their attention exclusively to the first step in the scientific scale, and biologists to pursue their studies without any solid basis or definite purpose. 
Special studies carried on without regard for the encyclopedic principles which determine the relative value of knowledge and its bearing on human life will be condemned by all men of right feeling and good sense. Such men will feel the necessity of resisting the morbid narrowness of mind and heart to which the anarchy of our times inevitably leads. But the abolition of the academic system will only ensure a larger measure of respect for all scientific researches of real value on whatever subject. The study of mathematics, the value of which is at present negatived by its hardening tendency, will now manifest its latent moral efficacy as the only sure basis for firm conviction, a state of mind that can never be perfectly attained in more complex subjects of thought, except by those who have experienced it in the simpler subjects. When the close connection of all scientific knowledge becomes more generally admitted, humanity will reject political teachers who are ignorant of geometry, as well as geometricians who neglect sociology. Biology, meanwhile, will lose its dangerous materialism and will receive all the respect due to its close connection with social science and its important bearing on the essential doctrines of positivism. To attempt to explain the life of humanity without first examining the lower forms of life would be as serious an error as to study biology without regard to the social purpose which biology is intended to serve. Science has now become indispensable to the establishment of moral truth and at the same time its subordination to the inspirations of the heart is fully recognized. Thus it takes its place henceforward among the most essential functions of the priesthood of humanity. The supremacy of true feeling will strengthen reason, and will receive in turn from reason a systematic sanction. Natural philosophy, besides its evident value in regulating the spontaneous action of humanity, has a direct tendency to elevate human nature. It draws from the outer world that basis of fixed truth which is so necessary to control our various desires. The study of humanity, therefore, directly or indirectly, is for the future the permanent aim of science. And science is now, in a true sense, consecrated as the source from which the universal religion receives its principles. It reveals to us not merely the nature and conditions of the great being, but also its destiny in the successive phases of its growth. The aim is high and arduous. It requires continuous and combined exertion of all our faculties, but it ennobles the simplest processes of scientific investigation by connecting them permanently with subjects of the deepest interest. The scrupulous exactness and rigorous caution of the positive method, which when applied to unimportant subjects seems almost puerile, will be valued and insisted on when seen to be necessary for the efficacy of efforts relating to our most essential wants. Rationalism in the true sense of the word, so far from being incompatible with right feeling, strengthens and develops it by placing all the facts of the case, in social questions especially, in their true light. But however honorable the rank which science, when regenerated, will hold in the new religion, the sanction given to poetry will be even more direct and unqualified, because the function assigned to it is one which is more practical and which touches us more nearly. Its function will be the praise of humanity. All previous efforts of art have been but the prelude to this, its natural mission. A prelude often impatiently performed since art threw off the yoke of theocracy at an earlier period than science. Polytheism was the only true religion under which it had free scope. There it could idealize all the passions of our nature, no attempt being made to conceal the similarity of the gods to the human type. The change from polytheism to monotheism was unacceptable to art, because it narrowed its field. But towards the close of the Middle Ages it began to shake off the influence of obscure and chimerical beliefs, and take possession of its proper sphere. The field that now lies before it in the religion of humanity is inexhaustible. It is called upon to idealize the social life of man, which, in the time of the nations of antiquity, had not been sufficiently developed to inspire the highest order of poetry. In the first place, it will be of the greatest service in enabling men to realize the conception of humanity, subject only to the condition of not overstepping the fundamental truths of science. Science, unassisted, cannot define the nature and destinies of this great being with sufficient clearness. In our religion, the object of worship must be conceived distinctly, in order to be ardently loved and zealously served. Science, especially in subjects of this nature, 
is confined within narrow limits, it leaves inevitable deficiencies which aesthetic genius must supply. And there are certain qualities in art as opposed to science which specially qualify it for the representation of humanity. For humanity is distinguished from other forms of life by the combination of independence with cooperation, attributes which also are natural to poetry. For while poetry is more sympathetic than science, its productions have far more individuality, the genius of their author is more strongly marked in them, and the debt to his predecessors and contemporaries is less apparent. Thus the synthesis on which the inauguration of the final religion depends is one in which art will participate more than science, science furnishing merely the necessary basis. Its influence will be even greater than in the times of polytheism. For powerful as art appeared to be in those times, it could in reality do nothing but embellish the fables to which the confused ideas of theocracy had given rise. By its aid we shall, for the first time, rise at last to a really human point of view and be enabled distinctly to understand the essential attributes of the great being of whom we are members the material power of humanity and the successive phases of her physical her intellectual and above all her moral progress will each in turn be depicted without the difficulties of analytical study we shall gain a clear knowledge of her nature and her conditions by the poet's description of her future destiny of her constant struggle against painful fatalities which have at last become a source of happiness and greatness of the slow growth of her infancy of her lofty hopes now so near fulfillment the history of universal love the soul by which this great being is animated the history that is of the marvellous advance of man individually or socially from brutish appetite to pure unselfish sympathy is of itself an endless theme for the poetry of the future End of section 27. Recording by Scott Grace, Rochester, New York. Section 28 of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte. Translated by John Henry Bridges. Chapter 6 Conclusion The Religion of Humanity, Part 3. Comparisons, too, may be instituted, in which the poet, without specially attacking the old religion, will indicate the superiority of the new. The attributes of the new great being may be forcibly illustrated, especially during the time of transition, by contrast with the inferiority of her various predecessors. All theological types are absolute, indefinite, and immutable. Consequently, in none of them has it been possible to combine to a satisfactory extent the attributes of goodness, wisdom, and power nor can we conceive of their combination except in a being whose existence is a matter of certainty and who is subject to invariable laws the gods of polytheism were endowed with energy and sympathy but possessed neither dignity nor morality they were superseded by the sublime deity of monotheism who was sometimes represented as inert and passionless sometimes as impenetrable and inflexible but the new supreme being having a real existence, an existence relative and modifiable, admits of being more distinctly conceived than the old, and the influence of the conception will be equally strong and far more elevating. Each of us will recognize in it a power superior to his own, a power on which the whole destiny of his life depends, since the life of the individual is in every respect subordinate to the evolution of the race the knowledge of this power has not the crushing effect of the old conception of omnipotence for every great or good man will feel that his own life is an indispensable element in the great organism the supremacy of humanity is but the result of individual cooperation her power is not supreme it is only superior to that of all beings whom we know our love for her is tainted by no degrading fears yet it is always coupled with the most sincere reverence 
perfection is in no wise claimed for her we study her natural defects with care in order to remedy them as far as possible the love we bear to her is feeling as noble as it is strong it calls for no degrading expressions of adulation but it inspires us with unremitting zeal for moral improvement but these and other advantages of the new religion though they can be indicated by the philosopher need the poet to display them in their full light the moral grandeur of man when freed from the chimeras that oppress him was foreseen by goethe and still more clearly by byron but the work of these men was one of destruction and their types could only embody the spirit of revolt poetry must rise above the negative stage in which owing to the circumstances of the time their genius was arrested and must embrace in the positive spirit the system of sociological and other laws to which human development is subject before it can adequately portray the new man in his relation to the new god there is yet another way in which art may serve the cause of religion that is in organizing the festivals whether private or public of which to a great extent the worship of humanity will consist for this purpose aesthetic talent is far more required than scientific the object in view being to reveal the nature of the great organism more clearly by presenting all aspects of its existence static or dynamic in idealized forms these festivals then should be of two kinds corresponding to the two essential aspects of humanity the first illustrating her existence the second her action thus we shall stimulate both the elements of true social feeling the love of order namely and the love of progress in our static festivals social order and the feeling of solidarity will be illustrated the dynamic festivals will explain social progress and inspire the sense of historical continuity taken together their periodic recurrence will form a continuation of positive education they will develop and confirm the principles instilled in youth but there will be nothing didactic in their form since it is of the essence of art not to instruct otherwise than by giving pleasure of course the regular recurrence of these festivals will not prevent any modifications which may be judged necessary to adapt them to special incidents that may from time to time arise the festivals representing order will necessarily take more abstract and austere forms than those of progress it will be their object to represent the statical relations by which the great organism preserves its unity and the various aspects of its animating principle love the most universal and the most solemn of these festivals will be the feast of humanity which will be held throughout the west at the beginning of the new year thus consecrating the only custom which still remains in general use to relieve the prosaic dullness of modern life in this feast which celebrates the most comprehensiveness of all unions every branch of the human race will at some future time participate in the same month there might be three festivals of a secondary order representing the minor degrees of association the nation the province and the town giving this first month the direct celebration of the social tie we might devote the first days of the four succeeding months to the four principal domestic relations connubial parental filial and fraternal in the sixth month the honorable position of domestic service would receive its due measure of respect these would be the static festivals taken together they would form a representation of the true theory of our individual and social nature together with the principles of moral duty to which that theory gives rise no direct mention is made of the personal instincts notwithstanding their preponderance because it is the main object of positive worship to bring them under the control of the social instincts personal virtues are by no means neglected in positive education but to make them the objects of any special celebration would only stimulate egotistic feeling indirectly their value is recognized in every part of our religious system in the reaction which they exercise upon our generous sympathies their omission therefore implies no real deficiency in this ideal portraiture of human faculties and duties again no special announcement of the subordination of humanity to the laws of the external world is needed the consciousness of this external power pervades every part of the positive system it controls our desires directs our speculations stimulates our actions the simple fact of the recurrence of our ceremonies at fixed periods determined by the earth's motion is enough to remind us of our inevitable subjection to the fatalities of the external world as the static festivals represent morality so the dynamic festivals those of progress will represent history 
in these the worship of humanity assumes a more concrete and animated form as it will consist principally in rendering honor to the noblest types of each phase of human development it is desirable however that each of the more important phases should be represented in itself independently of the greatness of any individual belonging to it of the months unoccupied by static festivals three might be given to the principal phases of past fetichism polytheism and monotheism and a fourth to the celebration of the future the normal state to which all these phases have been tending forming thus the chain of historical succession we may consecrate each month to some one of the types who best represent the various stages i omit however some explanations of detail given in the first edition of this general view written at the time when i had not made the distinction between abstract and concrete worship sufficiently clear a few months after its publication in eighteen forty eight the circumstances of the time induced me to frame a complete system of commemoration applicable to western europe under the title of positivist calendar of this i shall speak more at length in the fourth volume of the present treatise its success has fully justified me in anticipating this part of my subject to it i now refer the reader recommending him to familiarize himself with the provisional arrangement of the new western year then put forward and already adopted by most positivists but the practice need not be restricted to names of european importance it is applicable in its degree to each separate province and even to private life catholicism offers two institutions in which the religion of the family connects itself with public worship in its most comprehensive sense there is a day appointed in catholic countries in which all are in the habit of visiting the tombs of those dear to them finding consolation for their grief by sharing it with others to this custom positivists devote the last day of the year the working classes of paris give every year a noble proof that complete freedom of thought is in no respect compatible with worship of the dead which in their case is unconnected with any system again there is the institution of baptismal names which though little thought of at present will be maintained and improved by positivism it is an admirable mode of impressing on men the connection of private with public life by furnishing every one with a type for his own personal imitation here the superiority of the new religion is very apparent since the choice of a name will not be limited to any time or country in this as in other cases the absolute spirit of catholicism proved fatal to its prospects of becoming universal these brief remarks will be enough to illustrate the two classes of festivals instituted by positivism in every week of the year some new aspect of order or of progress will be held up to public veneration and in each the link connecting public and private worship will be found in the adoration of woman in this aesthetic side of positive religion everything tends to strengthen its fundamental principle of love all the resources of poetry and of the other arts of sound and form will be invoked to give full and regular expression to it the dominant feeling is always that of deep reverence proceeding from sincere acknowledgment of benefits received our worship will be alike free from mysticism and from affectation while striving to surpass our ancestors we shall yet render due honor to all their services and look with respect upon their systems of life influenced no longer by chimeras which though comforting to former times are now degrading we have now no obstacle to becoming as far as possible incorporate with the great being whom we worship by commemoration of past services we strengthen the desire inherent in all of us to prolong our existence in the only way which is really in our power the fact that all human affairs are subject to one fundamental law as soon as it becomes familiarly known enables and encourages each of one of us to live in a true sense in the past and even in the future as those cannot do who attribute the events of life to the agency of an arbitrary and impenetrable will the praise given to our predecessors will stimulate a noble rivalry inspiring all with the desire to become themselves incorporate into this mighty being whose life endures through all time and who is formed of the dead far more than the living when the system of commemoration is fully developed no worthy cooperator will be excluded however humble his sphere whether limited to his family or town or extending to his country or to the whole west the education of positivists will soon convince them that such recompense for honorable conduct is ample compensation for the imaginary hopes which inspired their predecessors to live in others is in the truest sense of the word life indeed the best part of our own life is passed thus 
and yet this truth has not been grasped firmly because the social point of view has never yet been brought systematically before us but the religion of humanity by giving an aesthetic form to the positivist synthesis will make it intelligible to the minds of every class and will enable us to enjoy the untold charm springing from the sympathies of union and of continuity when allowed free play to prolong our life indefinitely in the past and future so as to make it more perfect in the present is abundant compensation for the illusions of our youth which have now passed away for ever science which deprived us of these imaginary comforts itself in its maturity supplies the solid basis for consolation of a kind unknown before the hope of becoming incorporate into the great being whose static and dynamic laws it has revealed on this firm foundation poetry raises the structure of public and private worship and thus all are made active partakers in this universal life which minds still fettered by theology cannot understand thus imagination while accepting the guidance of reason will exercise a far more efficient and extensive influence than in the days of polytheism for the priests of humanity the sole purpose of science is to prepare the field for art whether aesthetic or industrial this object once attained poetic study or composition will form the chief occupation of our speculative faculties the poet is now called to his true mission which is to give beauty and grandeur to human life by inspiring a deeper sense of our relation to humanity poetry will form the basis of the ceremonies in which the new priesthood will solemnize more efficiently than the old the most important events of private life especially birth marriage and death so as to impress the family as well as the state with the sense of this relation forced as we are henceforth to concentrate all our hopes and efforts upon the real life around us we shall feel more strongly than ever that all the powers of imagination as well as those of reason feeling and activity are required in its service poetry once raised to its proper place the arts of sound and form which render in a more vivid way the subjects which poetry has suggested will soon follow their sphere like that of poetry will be the celebration of humanity an exhaustless field leaving no cause to regret the chimeras which in the present empirical condition of these arts are still considered indispensable music in modern times has been limited almost entirely to the expression of individual emotions its full power has never been felt in public life except in the solitary instance of the marseillaise in which the whole spirit of our great revolution stands recorded but in the worship of humanity based as it is on positive education and animated by the spirit of poetry music as the most social of the special arts will aid in the representation of the attributes and destinies of humanity and in the glorification of great historical types painting and sculpture will have the same object they will enable us to realize the conception of humanity with greater clearness and precision than would be possible for poetry even with the aid of music the beautiful attempts of the artists in the sixteenth century men who had very little theological belief to embody the christian ideal of woman may be regarded as an unconscious prelude to the representation of humanity in the form which of all others is most suitable under the impulse of these feelings the sculptor will overcome the technical difficulties of representing figures and groups and will adopt such subjects by preference hitherto this has only been effected in bas-reliefs works which stand midway between painting and sculpture there are however some splendid exceptions from which we can imagine the scope and grandeur of the latter art when raised to its true position statuesque groups whether the figures are joined or as is preferable separate will enable the sculptor to undertake many great subjects from which he has been hitherto debarred in architecture the influence of positivism will be felt less rapidly but ultimately this art like the rest will be made available for the new religion the buildings erected for the service of god may for a time suffice for the worship of humanity in the same way that christian worship was carried on at first in pagan temples as they were gradually vacated but ultimately buildings will be required more specially adapted to a religion in which all the functions connected with education and worship are so entirely different what these buildings will be it would be useless at present to inquire it is less easy to foresee the positivist ideal in architecture than in any other arts and it must remain uncertain until the new principles of education have been generally spread and until the positivist religion having received all the aid that poetry music and the arts of form can give has become the accepted faith of western europe 
when the more advanced nations are heartily engaged in the cause the true temples of humanity will soon arise by that time mental and moral regeneration will have advanced far enough to commence the reconstruction of all political institutions until then the new religion will avail itself of christian churches as these gradually become vacant art then as well as science partakes in the regenerating influence which positivism derives from its synthetic principle of love both are called to their proper functions the one to contemplate the other to glorify humanity in order that we may love and serve her more perfectly yet while the intellect is thus made the servant of the heart far from being weakened by this subordinate position it finds in it an exhaustless field in which the value of its labors is amply recognized each of its faculties is called directly into play and is supplied with its appropriate employment poetry institutes the forms of the worship of humanity science supplies the principles on which those forms are framed by connecting them with the laws of the external world imagination while ceasing to usurp the place of reason yet enhances rather than diminishes its original influence which the new philosophy shows to be as beneficial as it is natural and thus human life at last attains that state of perfect harmony which has been so long sought for in vain and which consists in the direction of all our faculties to one common purpose under the supremacy of affection at the same time all former efforts of imagination and reason even when they clashed with each other are fully appreciated because we see that they developed our powers that they taught us the conditions of their equilibrium and made it manifest that nothing but that equilibrium was wanting to allow them to work together for our welfare above all do we recognize the immense value of the medieval attempt to form a complete synthesis although notwithstanding all the results of greek and roman civilization the time was not yet ripe for it to renew that attempt on a sounder basis and with surer prospects of success is the object of those who would found the religion of humanity widely different as are their circumstances and the means they employ they desire to regard themselves as the successors of the great men who conducted the progressive movement of catholicism for those alone are worthy to be called successors who continue or carry into effect the undertakings which former times have left unfinished the title is utterly unmerited by blind followers of obsolete dogmas which have long ceased to bear any relation to their original purpose and which their very authors if now living would disavow end of section twenty eight